Good evening, Jackman Radio fans, supporters, and friends all around the world. I get messages from people all over the world. I'm your host, Eric Jackman, doing a solo episode tonight. Uh, Mike's my twin brother. He's taking the night off. But I am psyched to be joined by this gentleman, Mr. Chris Graves. Uh, He is the host of Get Mad with Chris Graves on the Ocelli network. Did I say that right, Chris? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's perfect. Ocelli.com. Yeah. <laughs> the Ocelli.com, and we'll show that stuff. Uh, Chris, how you doing tonight, man? Hey, I, I'm doing pretty good, uh, pretty well, and I'm honored to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, I was chatting with Chris uh, before we went live, and he came uh, to my attention last week. I was uh, closing out a work week and got myself a nice turkey and cheese sub to treat myself on Friday. And I'm like, I'm going to do some kind of fun podcast tonight. I'm going to watch and just, you know, let loose. And I'm like, I haven't watched tinfoil hat with Sam Tripoli in a while. So I wanted to see what he was up to. So I went to Sam's Twitter and he said, uh, you know, his guest for that night or that re- most recent episode was, this was you, Chris, a guy named Chris Graves. And they were talking about Columbine, uh, Courtney loves father, his connections, um, and some stuff that you don't really see a lot of people in the alternate independent media talk about stuff that I'm certainly interested in. And I've looked at a little bit and, and have talked about a little bit, but, um, I perked right up when I saw that you guys were talking about that. So I'm like, well, I'm going to watch this, take some notes, and then hopefully I can get in touch with this guy. And then I hit you up on Twitter and, uh, responded and, and here we are tonight. So I guess, you know, to get started, uh, Chris, just tell uh, the audience a little bit about who you are and, and how you kind of got into this world of podcasting and researching and becoming a writer. Well, uh, well, first of all, with uh, conspiracies and things like that, um, I was, you know, I, nothing too, uh, nothing too intricate, like UFOs, like back in the nineties. Um, not really JFK. Uh, I mean, I had heard rumors that there was this video turned out to be the Zapruder film and people even in my junior high were talking about, Oh, do you know that the driver turned around and shot him? Like I, I kept hearing this whole thing. And uh, that was a theory for a while. I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, but it was interesting though. Uh, and then I think with Kurt Cobain, like I was a big uh, grunge fan or a fan in, uh, you know, heavy metal, hard rock in, in junior high and high school. So when he died, um, I started following that fairly close to when it actually occurred in 1994. I'd say about maybe a year later, I found out about a guy named uh, a private investigator named Tom Grant. Um, he was hired by Courtney Love uh, to find Kurt when he actually didn't need to be found because uh, apparently she already knew where Kurt was. So there's so a lot of weird stuff uh, about that. Uh, and then, of course, later on, Columbine uh, happened. But at the time, I didn't really think it was there was anything weird about it other than being a tragedy um and what they told us and everything but the one that really got me going was 9-11 like right on the day because uh, i remember when there were explosions going off and uh first responders and reporters and people talking about you know these these bombs going off or it, just explosions and stuff i uh foolishly thought that we were going to find out that whoever flew the planes somehow got access to the buildings before 9-11 you know i thought that that was going to be a part of the story like somehow they they got access to uh planting explosives all throughout the twin towers that never happened like after the first day day and a half they never brought up the explosions and all that ever again for about a year and a half and then people like alex jones and others they started uh showing footage on the internet of you know all these people saying these things on the day and it made me remember like oh yeah that's right and i just always had a weird feeling about it anyway um but yeah 9 11 would be the one uh, i know it changed a lot of people's lives rightfully so and uh yeah so i think from there on i went and dug into the past like uh, with jfk jr i studied that one pretty pretty well uh columbine i found out like a lot of the witnesses said there were up to eight to ten shooters including cops like on the day like in the local media especially and they thought it was actually a terrorist attack at first that's why they didn't want to storm the high school that story went away um yeah and kirk cobain and twa 800 too i looked into because 
I had heard uh, that there were videos being shown on the night that it came down, that plane came down, that there were videos shown on various uh, cable and uh, New York local news stations that showed a missile going up and hitting and taking out the plane. But those videos all got wiped away, and I was fascinated. Like, not fascinated, as the people, a lot of people died. I it, I was drawn into the this idea that they could, you know, who could, you know, the, the power in, like, being able to take all these videos and, like, basically telling thousands of people that saw it on TV that they didn't see what they saw. Like, for some reason, there was an air of mystery to, to that. So I started looking into that aspect of TWA. Because I know there were a, a lot of witnesses, like, in person that saw streaks of light coming up off, off the right. uh, land and water. But, yeah. Uh, and then later on, uh, I'm making this very long. I apologize. Um, oh, man. It's your background. I, you know, the stuff that fascinates us. And yeah, it's, I mean. It's going. Basically, uh, with the lockdown and everything, I, I'd say about maybe a year or two before that, I uh, got in contact with an author by the name of Donald Jeffries. He wrote books like Hidden History and uh, Crimes and Cover-Ups, Survival of the Richest. Uh, he's pretty well known in like alternative media. He has his own show. Um, so I started kind of doing research for him uh, for his uh, later on, uh, his his more modern day books, you know, not the original ones. And trying to get guests for his show, I protest. And we became really, really good friends. And ever since, uh, it kind of like uh, opened up other opportunities for me, like doing my own uh, show or, uh, yeah, basically uh, being a guest on people like yourself, like on shows like this. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm good. I'm 36. I'll be 37 this year. So, you know, I'm very much a child of the 9 11 generation. I was a freshman. Yeah in high school when that happened so obviously i remember it vividly and you know even before that i was interested in the kennedy assassination and cold war history cuban missile crisis and that kind of stuff and you know it's only after you get out of school for a while and you can kind of start to think for yourself that you realize the stuff that we're taught in school and even in college is yeah. such a departure from the actual reality of, of what happened with this stuff and these big events and you're just, you're just given a s tiny superficial snapshot of these big kind of events, and then that's it. Move on to the next thing. And well, you know, mainstream history is written by the victors, right? Yeah, it's it's written and framed by exactly the people who come out on top and actually yeah. have the ability and, and the resources and the power to shape the perception of our history. So yeah. even getting to a point where you can understand that and recognize that and realize that, I think, is a triumph and a victory in, in of itself. But it's then, overwhelming at first, but eventually there's a calming a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it, it is overwhelming. And, you know, 9-11, I, I was very suspicious of it, um, you know, especially leading up to Iraq when you saw the guys in power, the neocons and the PNAC group, the Project for New American Century group, yeah. uh, pushing the drumbeat for war with Iraq and wanting to tie 9-11 in with Saddam Hussein and saying he, there was a connection and now they he's got weapons. They, they used, uh, well, when I say they, and the anthrax uh, letter attacks and the DC sniper was lumped in with all that, that fear going on. Yeah, people, people, exactly, man. People forget about anthrax. They, they, they forget that that happened and what that was all about. And that helped that, get the Patriot Act signed in overnight. Oh, everybody. Yeah. oh, fear, man. It was it was totally fear. And I honestly had not seen that level of overall proliferated fear in our country, in the world and media uh, leading up to uh, I call COVID the flu world order leading up to that. I hadn't seen that <laughs> yeah. since Iraq and 9-11. And then they ratcheted it up a thousand fold for Those COVID. Those are connected too. And, yeah, and, and even the Boston year. bombing was kind of a beta test for the lockdown. Stay home, you know. <laughs> yeah, so after <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the bombing. <laughs> after after I watched you on uh, Sam Tripoli, um, and we talked a little bit about Dave McGowan. Yeah. I, I dug up Dave McGowan on Caravan at Midnight with John B. Wells talking yeah. about the Boston Marathon, and I guess I don't think I realized that McGowan had done so much digging and in research before he died on the Boston Marathon bombing. So probably what got him killed. Like a, um, close to him, I think that too. 
Yeah, people say he was killed, and then his daughter said he wasn't really the healthiest guy. Like he smoked cigarettes, and the rest of the family. Well, yeah, let's say the re the rest of the family are not really on board with some of the other relatives. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, it's probably like anything, man. You know, people yeah. in the people in the family agree and disagree on things. I mean, you look at Robert. Some Kennedy. Don't, yeah, some people don't want to uh, even be open to that idea. And why would you? You know? Yeah, entertain the fact that you know in America, your dad, who was just a normal. Construction yeah, because he had his own construction thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah construction. And I, I mentioned to you, uh, McGowan reminded me a lot of like my uncles because they're like contractors, they're builders, um, yeah. really brilliant, um, creative guys to play music, but they're also deep researchers. And they had a really big hand in, in kind of framing, you know, the questioning of things when I was a kid. You know, my uncle telling me about JFK and like, oh, yeah. what you're hearing in school is bullshit, man. That's that's not what happened in that. Wow. Kind of you know, a lot of people, uh, people are going to think like when I say that you're very lucky because uh, or they're probably going to think I'm nuts. But like, no, you're very lucky that you had uh, adult figures like that that were uh, being totally open and, and honest with you about like our history. Yeah, I, 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 it is, man. I do feel fortunate because there, there was one. Um, these are my dad's brothers, and my dad uh, passed away. Saturday will be six years. He's been gone, but he was very much like that too. He looked deeply into things, um, and they, they're all from Canada originally. So there was that half of them that were like into deep esoteric knowledge and research, yeah. and they were builders and contractors and created things. But also they played hockey. And like they had a balance, they had a balance with the two. Things. Those are the those are the respectable people. In my in my they got their hands dirty. They went to work. You know, they manual labor. Did yeah. they work? If you don't mind me asking, did they work for themselves? Like yeah, that, oh, the, all all self employed. Awesome. So yeah, my dad and his brothers had a wood woodworking company uh, in the seventies that they built furniture for people, That's and uh, awesome. they were based out of Farnsworth Street in Boston, and then they were in Hudson, Mass, and they had a big woodworking company. Yeah. And it was my dad and his uh, five brothers. And so they're always, you know, always have been in business for themselves, never had a boss. Um, so when I see, like, when I first encountered Dave McGowan, I just instantly kind of felt yeah. a, uh, a kinship to him and like a connection to, to just his essence and his energy yeah. and his, his just his plain speak and his fearlessness about major events. Yeah. And he, he did all that, like we were just saying, like he had his own construction business. <laughs> Yeah, he did all of that research like at night, like on his own right. as a hobby. Yeah, I just I just picture him either. I just well, picture him on the job site like banging nails and then on his lunch break he's got a sandwich and he's reading about the moon landing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Those those ones are way too tough to be able to focus the camera and everything. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. All right. His, yeah, yeah his, his his most humorous work was wagging the moon doggy. I have yeah, I haven't delved into that yet. Oh, I'll, you're I'll, enjoy I'll be it. honest, man. It, like with conspiracies and stuff, I know the moon landing is like a a big one, and I, I haven't gone too deep in it. Um, I haven't you, really, but except for with him, it, that actually pulled me in more because he made sense. Like he pointed out how ridiculous a lot of this is, like because people don't just sit back and think about it, like in like he did. He dissected the whole thing. He used their, NASA's own uh, pictures, and you're going to enjoy it. I have a feeling. <laughs> Yeah. Um, have you heard of Alex Stein, Primetime 99? I My friend Donald Jeffries on his show. He's had oh. him on twice now, I think. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I've had him on the show, and he's, like, really big into the moon landing. Like, he had Bart Sibrel on. Sibrel, and also Donald had him on. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. so you know all these guys. Oh, um, yeah. So I've looked at some of their stuff. Like I haven't, I haven't gone too deep into the moon landing stuff. But um, I mean, with, with Buzz Aldrin punching uh, Sibrel, I think, uh, in the film. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Swear okay. on this Bible. Swear that the you Bible. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, my God. you know, man, it, it, uh, the way how crazy things are, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't happen. You know, I don't know. I, I need to look more into it. I'm, I'm open to checking it out and having a, having a laugh and researching it. Well, like the flat earth stuff. I don't make fun of people that are into the flat. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. We've been lied to so many that's, times. I that's, don't it. Know. that's it, Chris. I'm not in the business of mocking people or belittling people's intelligence because yeah. they're willing, to, they're willing to look at something and entertain something because yeah. It's just been proven time and time again that we are lied to about literally everything in our lives. From right. our, the, the yeah. moment we're born, we're put in front of a TV screen, and everything that came out of that TV screen and was beamed at us into our face That's was right. bullshit. Was bullshit. Basically, yeah. And, and now with the internet age, uh, now they can come at us from all kinds of angles. You know, 
Back yeah. then, it was just the radio waves and the, the boob tube, as it was called back in the day. Yeah, yeah, man. So it's and and you think about like some of the the, the figures, the skulls, uh, the actors like Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise, and we've yeah. been. I, I say this with my brother when we go just to unplug and go enjoy a movie. Um, Hard to know of, when you find out these people, you know. Well, yeah. When when well, that's it. So when you you go, Tom with, Hanks one hurt. I, I <laughs> never heard. I'm not kidding. Yeah, the Hank, the Hank stuff uh, is interesting. That that gal there, Sarah Ruth Ashcraft, accused him of of uh, yeah. you know abusing her as a child, yeah. Um, yeah. and there was never really any follow up on that or anything. But um, no, you're looking at Tom Hanks a little bit. There's some suspect uh, stuff there. But the point I was making, you know, we go into these these big movies. Like, I'll, I'll admit it, man. I really enjoy on an entertainment value factor. I enjoyed the new Top Gun this past year. It was yeah. it was entertaining. It was loud. I know it was just pure propaganda pure militarism, you know, jerking off the military industrial complex and recruiting I'm for the Ram I'm a fan of the Rambo movies, so I'm just oh. a Yeah. Yeah, so you, you can so like I spoke about like being able to separate things and have balance in your life. Yeah. So when you, when you do go deep into this stuff and do research it and go really really into it, um, it's easy to have that ruin everything. Like literally yeah. ruin suck all the joy and happiness out of your life exactly. and and yeah. ruin everything. And like it did that for, you know, we call it bread and circus. It did that for bread and circus for many years in my life. Like for many years, I was like, oh, you know, going to a hockey game is stupid. Even though I grew up on the ice, I grew up playing. It was something I inherited. My dad passed down to me. He taught me how to play. I used to go to games with him, you know, the Boston Bruins. Yep. Um, but then you just like realize all of that. It doesn't really mean anything. And it's just a child sport being played by grown men who are being paid millions of dollars. And it's just all advertisements <laughs> for uh, Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser and the pharmaceutical companies. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it ruins it. Best, in my opinion, out of well, all of them, I can't stand any of the other ones. But. Well, I'm, I'm with you on that, Chris. I'm biased on that. But um, so for years, it kind of ruined it for me. And I was just kind of like a Debbie Downer about it. But, yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm working on balance on that. So I've gone to a couple Bruins games this year. I sat two rows back. I went a couple weeks ago and I just I let go of everything for a few hours and I just enjoyed the game. Just was there it. was there a moment, if you don't want me asking, that made you kind of like tore that apart for you? That made you kind of feel that way? Well, when you're when you're so deep into researching uh, conspiracies oh, and okay. the, the the horrible shit that the the predator class does right. to the people and and what they get away with, um, hockey it, game does, it just doesn't seem like it's important. Right. Well, you're you're like well, this is this is stupid. The, the yeah. at its core, it's it's a child sport that men are adult men are playing. But the reality of it is, it's a multi billion dollar racket in an industry. Yeah. You know, a beer is twenty dollars, a ticket's two hundred dollars, parking's fifty dollars, a hot dog's twenty dollars. You know, it, it's it's just this is just uh, mindless yeah. consumption. To let and, down, yeah. yeah. Same with the music for me too. Like I used to go to concerts all the time. Yeah. COVID didn't help, but before that it was even too expensive, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it just, it, it ruined it for a while, but then finally I'm like, you know what? I have to still enjoy things in life and yeah. not look at everything through the lens as of this is just part of an agenda. This is just meant to distract us. We need to yeah. keep focusing on what's really going on because you just get caught in that loop and you keep doing that continuously. You're going to be a miserable person. I mean, you have I to have a sense of humor too. That's why my humor <laughs> is like kind of dark. You know what I mean? Oh, like, oh yeah. <laughs> not oh, kind yeah. of. It's pitch black. <laughs> you know? But you have to because it's kind of like I'm not. I'm not equating myself to like a, a policeman or a soldier, but that kind of gallows humor uh, to be able to deal with things, horrible things. You know? Yeah. Oh, humor is humor is the only way to deal with it. Yeah, and making making fun of it, and because you know that's really what we have at the end of the day. It's our uh, our freedom of thought and our elevating our consciousness, and then just making fun of the powerful. Because as long as we still have that, so far. yeah, I'm not <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm not into violence, and you get you go into violence that plays right into their hand. Oh yeah, no, yeah, violence is horrible. Yeah, no, I mean like, uh, how long are we going to have our free thoughts? <laughs> oh. I hate saying it like that, but like, and then you got like Neuralink being proposed. Uh, uh, yeah, Alex know. Jones is like, let's, let's talk about Neuralink to uh, with Neuralink, Neuralink and the gay frogs. The gay frogs yeah. are going to have the Neuralink. You know? Gay frogs and Neuralink. It's in the Capri Sun. <laughs> <laughs> the Capri Sun. Yeah, I but, um, yeah, I, I got the documents, Chris, Infowars.com. But um, 
yeah so we still yeah. we, we have to have balance and still enjoy things but i think it, it's it's important to always you know look behind the facade yeah um of what is presented to us so mcgowan certainly did that so he's um, actually i really do feel like he's the first 9-11 truther on 9-12 he had the, basically the whole story out the next day on his website he broke it down like all the what didn't make sense what you know all the reporting that was different that didn't add up and it was 9 12 like you go back on his website center for an informed america cia see he had a sense of humor right there so yeah. you go on that you see it 9 12 yeah it yeah. talks all about uh going into the tyranny you know yeah i'll pull up his uh website right now he was I funny yeah that was the other thing like he used humor to deal with these pitch black topics I mean, he didn't really use the humor too much with, uh, you know, obviously he had a series called The Ped Pedophocracy, which went mm. into hell. Basically, he was looking into uh, the pedophile, elite pedophile stuff, like worldwide before many people, actually. Yeah, I think he dug into Dutro in Belgium. Yes, he did. Yeah. Dutro affair. And this is yeah. all before Epstein became a household name to your average person. This was like 2000, 2001, 2002. He was writing about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he put a bunch of it in his, his book, Program to Kill. A bunch of that went into that, too. Yeah. There, there, there was a while after reading Program to Kill that I regretted reading that book. It's, it's, <laughs> that one, he didn't use humor too much because, like, how, 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 you, you know, dark shit, man. Yeah. And if, if it really is close to what he was saying, yeah. Help us all. Well, <laughs> I know you, you wonder about some of the big serial killers and the idea of a serial killer and the sensationalism behind it. And like it, it, it could make sense to you that some of these serial killers who everyone assumed was a lone wolf or it, doing it by themselves, they were part of something bigger. Like a cult almost. They like were involved in a, yeah, yeah, involved in a cult. I mean, Son of Sam, it's basically it's kind of yeah. common knowledge to anyone who will dig a little bit that Berkowitz was not alone in that. They've even done documentaries. They had a task force in New York yeah. about it. Everything. Yeah. And so the task that, force got closed quietly, I think. And that yeah, was kind of weird too. That's wild, man. So the yeah. I think the thing, you know, in alternative media and kind of you know, truth seekers, the yeah. one of the things McGowan's most well known for is his dive into sixties counterculture. Weird scenes inside the canyon. Yeah, yeah. strange but tr but mostly true story of Laurel Canyon and the birth of the hippie generation. So if you had to kind of, um, you kind of had a similar thing with the serial killer thing too, that they both were socially engineered things. Like yeah. one to on the anti-war movement with the, the rise of the hippies and the, the acid going out, you know, and then with the serial killer thing, they, we really, I mean, yeah, throughout history, we had a couple of lone wolves supposedly or whatever. Like you had Jack the Ripper, you had, you know, um, well, I'll say John Wilkes Booth, even though that's kind of iffy now. Um, they won't even dig up his grave to see if it's actually him in it. And his, his family <laughs> wants it ha to happen. But they say, oh, no, no, like the state parks or whatever. And they're like, no, we can't do that. That's but anyway, yeah, no, the, the serial killer phenomenon, too, it, it just seems like um, they all started these um, celebrity serial killers started to become a thing in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. And it was like a fear-based mind control. And that's what Dave used to talk about a lot too, that trauma. Yeah. yeah. So if you had to kind of summarize uh, his work on Laurel Canyon in the 60s counterculture to someone who wasn't familiar with it, how, how would you put that to somebody? Basically, Dave went and he found a, he read a book about um, Laurel Canyon, which is an area in Los Angeles where a lot of um, very interesting and even very powerful and very famous people kind of gra all gravitated towards in the 60s, uh, including movie stars like Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Jack Nicholson. And then you had a good portion of that was um, the music scene because prior to that, L.A. wasn't really known uh, for its music. It was just the movie thing. New York in like um uh what's the one with the country and everything nashville. nashville nashville and new york were known mainly to be the music hubs of the country at the time 
Then all of a sudden you started to hear these bands started popping up in the 60s around Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles. And they started playing the clubs on the Sunset Strip and Hollywood Boulevard and like the doors and everything. Anyway, you find out that most of these people, uh, whether it was in Hollywood movies or in the music scene, most of them came from a military brat or a a military slash intelligence family, like one or the other, or sometimes both, like the parents would be involved in the military or in the alphabet agencies. And it just seemed like they kind of came out of nowhere, this this whole scene. And some people that didn't have any talent at all were, were getting deals, record deals, and they were getting pushed onto the public. And a lot of the music was kind of, quote, unquote, anti-war, right? And then you really look at some of the lyrics for some of the songs. And that's not the case at all. But it, it created this image of the hippie. And the hippie thing, you know, oh, just drop acid, uh, just drop out, you know. And, oh, hey, man, you know, that whole deal. That wasn't really a thing before. Before it was like the beatniks, you know, things like that, right. like poets and things. And the real anti-war people were the college professors. You know, they're the ones that didn't want to go to Vietnam and everything. And then around that time, this this whole hippie thing kind of rose out of nowhere. And I'll give you an example. You ever heard of the Gulf of Tonkin incident? Yeah. That's the incident that supposedly never even happened now um, that propelled the America into the Vietnam War where 58,000 Americans died and probably well over a million Vietnamese died. And it was all over an incident that never occurred, apparently, um, because uh, Robert McNamara, uh, who worked under Kennedy at the time, right before he died, I believe it was 2001, around there, um, he did a book tour where he basically, it was almost like he was making amends or trying to before he died. To, say, to basically, you know, say I'm sorry, you know, and that this was all basically it was a lie. It didn't happen, right? And the Gulf of Tonkin in incident is supposed to be where North Vietnamese uh, shot upon uh, our boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. Well, the guy, there was a, uh, a guy named uh, Admiral um, uh, Morrison. Sorry, I had a, a real brain fart right now. Okay. Admiral, it's been a long week. <laughs> Admiral Morris, Morrison. His son was uh, a guy by the name of Jim Morrison of the Doors. Well, Jim Morrison's father was basically in charge of the Gulf of Tonkin incident that never happened, that propelled us into the Vietnam War. And his son, who Jim Morrison has said, I don't know how to read music. I don't know how to make, like, I don't know how to do music. All of a sudden he became this, you know, he was actually yeah. a film, film student actually. Yeah. And he, it was almost as, as if I'm not saying this is how it went down, but a lot of these bands at the time, the wrecking crew band seemed to be behind most of the, the big hits. Right. Yeah, exactly. Is that too convoluted? <laughs> no, man. So, well, no, that's a great that's a great example. It's one that I like to tell people about. They have no idea. So Admiral George Stephen Morrison, I got him pulled up here. He lived for a while, 1919 to 2008. He was yeah. 89 when he died. Certainly outlived his son, Jim Morrison. Um, was a United States Navy Rear Admiral. He was commander of the U.S. Naval Forces during the Gulf of Tonkin incident in August of 1964, which sparked an escalation of American involvement in the Vietnam War. And he was the father of Jim Morrison, the lead singer of the rock band The Doors, who died on July 3rd, 1971. Yeah. So this is just this is like one big example. And then you got like Frank Zappa, whose <laughs> yeah. father was a chemist at Edgewood Laboratory. Um, in where was that Illinois? Was I think, Illinois? yeah, I can look I that was... up. Ah, what was it? There's so many of them, yeah, <laughs> that that you kind of like, but they were basically in charge of uh napalm, I believe, right? Right, yeah, which would so McGowan digs into these players, and um, they all have connections to each other, and, too, and who, yeah, who they were, um. You know how they were connected, who their family was, yeah. and they were seemingly like clean cut, like good old American boys and people. Because the year prior, they actually, I think Dave actually found a picture of uh, Jim Morrison all clean cut. <coughs> in, 
on the, uh, on the ship with his father. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, essentially the, the thesis is that the 60s counterculture was a completely engineered yeah. uh, psyop, cr- you know, created by military intelligence, intelligence agencies, and they all came around this part uh, of California, Laurel Canyon. And then and, the, to, end it, to end the whole thing, the era, they introduced the uh, poorer version of the MK Ultra type stuff with the Manson family, right? And then you had the Patty Hearst uh, wealthy people that could be also brainwashed, like with, uh, you know, with the, her being brainwashed by the, what was it, the Lebanon? Um, Some liberation SLA. movement. Yeah, there's something like, yeah, SLA, I think. Yeah. But it basically, Patty Hearst and Squeaky Fromm, uh, you know, Charlie Manson's uh, right hand gal, or whatever you want to call her, they went to school together. And I didn't even know that. And Dr. Right. Jolly and West. Who mm-hmm. just got named by Tucker Carlson the other day? I weird. couldn't believe he dropped the name Jolly West. Yeah, the Fox rabbit Coast. hole. Where, well, I don't know what the play is here because no one would mention him over the well, years. Jolly maybe. Jolly West uh, was the guy that visited uh, Jack Ruby while he was imprisoned. And, and uh, McVay, Jack Ruby, Sir yeah. Patty Hearst, yeah. right, and uh, Jolly West, um, the. And, uh, Writer, he, he was MK Ultra. He was uh, in charge. He was in charge of a lot of their programs and things. For yeah, her. I'd like to see Tucker expand because yeah, he, he just he, he yeah. dropped the name. And That's if you right. don't know who jo- Jolly West is, you would you wouldn't know what he was talking. Wouldn't about. know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the, the kind of the synopsis about McGowan's book: weird scenes inside the canyon. Um. The very he's, strange. Well, he goes in very different areas, so it's really hard. Like. For like an idiot, like me to really encapsulate like everything, like uh, yeah. If he goes in, there's a, there's a secret military base that was in the Hollywood Hills called Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain, yep. And people like uh, Marilyn Monroe and um, you know famous directors of the time, they all had top secret clearance. So right. what were they doing there? That like the cover was that they were making the uh, the nuclear testing videos. videos. Yeah. But do they really need top secret? Like, I, yeah. I think something else was going on there. Maybe they filmed the moon landing stuff there. I don't know. You know, <laughs> if, if that if that you know was fake. I well, I love that Jared Leto owned the place. He at bought that it. Point. Now. Yeah. He. he oh, I, I don't know if he still, still does, but okay. um, yeah. So some of uh, so this is from Amazon. Members of bands like the Birds, the Doors, Buffalo Springfield, the Monkeys, the Beach yeah. Boys, the Turtles, the Eagles, Frank Zappa, Steppenwolf, Three Dog Night. And singer-songwriters such as Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, James Taylor, Carol King lived together and jammed together in the bucolic community nestled in the Hollywood Hills. But there was a dark side to that scene as well. Many did not make it out alive, and many of those deaths remain shrouded in mystery to this day. Far more integrated into the scene than most would like to admit was a guy named Charles Manson, along with his murderous entourage. Also floating about the periphery were various political operatives, up-and-coming politicians and intelligence personnel, the same sort of people who gave birth to many of the rock stars populating the canyon. And of all the canyon's colorful characters, rock stars, hippies, murderers, and politicals happily coexisted alongside a covert military installation that you just mentioned. So, you know... (laughs) When, when I think about some of the, the rock stars we learned about, like for, the movie Forrest Gump was like a good pipeline in to my generation because, you, you know, they, they yeah. put in all kinds of Americana into that movie. And yeah, John and Yoko on, this, on Dick Cabot with Forrest, you know. Yeah, yeah Abby Hoffman. Even, Abby Hoffman. The JFK, Black Panthers. Yeah. Dog Blue, you know. Did you uh, just say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I must have drank me 15 Dr. Peppers. And, um, <laughs> you know, so like the myth of a 60s icon and, and a rock star as a counterculture figure and the idea of a deadhead. And, and this, I think this is a good segue into talking about uh, Courtney Love's father. Hank so Harrison. I know yeah. you, you, you talked a little bit about that with Sam. Um, so I have an, an article here I can share. So yeah, Hank Harrison, was actually yeah, so, the, he was the first manager for the Grateful Dead until they kicked him out, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so he was he was their manager early on, Yeah, which a lot of people, I mean, I, I didn't know that. I mean, I think I knew that from before, but after I heard you talk about it, I'm like, holy shit, that's right, you he know, was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Uh, they didn't like him too much after, after a while. And uh, 
I don't know. I mean, there were allegations from Courtney herself, so consider the source, but I guess her yeah. mother as well had said that Hank had given her LSD when she was two, so uh, I don't, mm. you know. Yeah, I mean, look at him there. He's look at that picture look, right there. Yeah. He doesn't look, he doesn't look all there. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't look like he's, like, concerned for, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, in Hanging Around the Grateful Dead, um, they were obviously connected to CIA acid proliferation of the sixties in the acid tests and hate Ashbury yep. and all that. So it couldn't be, it can't be a stretch that Hank Harrison along the way had some kind of CIA connection. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, he had a good friend that on his friend's deathbed told him that he did work for the agency and that he actually uh, not only got with Courtney when she was like 17, I think, um, but also gave Courtney a whole lot of LSD to, to you know, spread out when she went to Ireland and England uh, in the right. 80s. And what was the purpose of that? To get, every, I guess, all the musician types to, to uh, you know, yeah. to drop out or whatever, you know, kind of like what people have alleged about Yoko Ono, you know, had the similarities there, you know. Yeah. Um, Yoko claimed she didn't know what who the Beatles were and... Uh, that's almost impossible. Yeah. Well, wasn't wasn't Yoko from like kind of a wealthy Japanese banking family? I had heard that as well uh, originally. Yeah. So she was, you yeah. know, an artist and all that, but also there was some money and power and wealth behind that. But um, when she met John, uh, John, like the Beatles were like the biggest thing in the world. But she claimed that when they met at one of her, uh, you know, art gallery exhibits, she had no idea who he was. And it's like, yeah, I think, I I think sure. even Paul was like, that's a low, you know, that's a crock. You know? Yeah, of course. Of course, you know who we are. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, because uh, who was the lyricist for the Grateful Dead? Um, oh, was who was basically confirmed like a CIA guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Let me look that up. Tell me the, great, the Grateful Dead. I'm always thinking of Jerry um, Garcia. I'm not like I'm, a huge fan of theirs, but I'm not a deadhead at all. I'm not a fish head. I used to know people that were into fish, like Rob, the jam band stuff. They never did it for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not really big into jam bands. I think it was Robert Hunter. Robert Hunter. Okay. Um. And and okay. Uh. Here we go. Around 1962, this is from his Wikipedia, Hunter volunteered for psychedelic chemical experiments at Stanford University, research covertly sponsored by the CIA and its MK Ultra program. Other participants included Ken Kesey and Allen Ginsberg. He was yeah. paid to take LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline and then report on his experiences, which were creatively formative for him. After a friend attempted to dissuade him, Hunter said, it'll be fun. I'll take my typewriter and no telling what'll come out. The incident was the first substantial experience of any of the Grateful Dead had with psychedelic drugs and the creative surge he experienced would prove influential on their collective outlook. Around this time, Hunter was briefly involved with Scientology and also struggled with addiction to meth and speed, which drove him to move briefly from LA to New Mexico. Um, so there you go, man. I mean, that just that right there. He was Stanford, Stan, the Stanford prison experiments, and yes, yeah. all of these big institutions like Stanford and the universities and psychiatric hospitals. I were believe just, at Harvard, if you look at Harvard, they did similar oh, yeah. things, but with Ted to Kaczynski. Me. Yes, yeah. Timothy Leary was there at Harvard, yeah. and yeah, Kaczynski was part of uh, acid, or maybe not acid, but definitely like behavioral. I think it was. I, or, I believe it was LSD. Yeah, it could have been. I'd have to dig into that again. Yeah, but that's um, another one too, where they're like, "Was there more than just one of those guys?" Uh, that's a whole thing too. Everything is weird. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so just that, that that's just a little tidbit to give to people who yeah. haven't really looked uh, into this or have even heard of it. There's a lot of people who won't even have known that the dude from the Grateful Dead was part of CIA uh, LSD MK Ultra acid experiments. Or even uh, Blue Oyster Cult with the Process Church and those oh, connections. Oh, yeah, Process Church. I haven't... Yeah. Wow. It, so, and then it, that mentioned Scientology um, and yep. L. Ron Hubbard was Naval Intelligence. Yeah. Um, and, and he got and, together with uh, uh, with Ant, um, Anton LaVey, I believe. Uh, LaVey. Church of Satan. And, yeah, Church of Satan. And then um, uh, Jack, uh, the guy that developed the rocket propulsion, uh, he was a practicing Satanist, but he was um, basically in charge of uh, the propulsion system for the rockets for NASA, Jack Parsons. 
They would all hang out, the three of them. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it's everything's connected, man. Wow. Yeah, it's an intersection of you know counterculture, intelligence, military intelligence, Cult. um, cults, <laughs> media, yeah, music, um, yeah. music, and it's and in that world, it really is a small world. You know, a lot of people know each other and they're connected, yeah. and you know, people people. That's think why you that, gotta wonder: Are they, these people lucky? You know, when they say, "Oh, I got my lucky break. I got my record deal, or I got got cast in a movie." It's like, well, what is yeah. like? Who's organically actually lucky when it comes to that stuff, and who's being given it? Especially yeah. now, and there's no one with talent, apparently, like with the arts, in my opinion. Well, you know? we're in the TikTok generation now the where computer, it's just, the computer just, makes everything now. <laughs> yeah, just film your ass and shake your ass, and you'll get two million followers. Well, I was promised that, and I still, I only have like 20 right now. So, you got to get on that, man. I know, I know. I got to be better <laughs> angle. Yeah, like, so. <laughs> so what are you uh what are you working on uh right now like what's something that you're currently kind of enmeshed in in uh you know obsessing over and thinking about before you go to bed what are you what are you looking at right now well the next podcast guest you know i actually did reach out to squeaky squeaky from she has a book um i'm actually reaching out to her for my buddy chuck Cocelli, who produces my uh get mad with chris grave show um, I think he'd be better suited because I think he actually talked to Charles Manson on the phone when he was in prison at one point. So he knows a lot more about that, that the whole Charles Manson thing, to be honest, flat out honest with you. Like he, it was kind of boring to me, the Helter Skelter thing. Like I, I gravitated towards like JFK assassination or like I said, Kurt Cobain, uh, death, you know, things like that. Um, what I'm working on right now is, well, I've written a couple of horror screenplays uh oh, that cool i'd like to uh you know try to get crowdsourcing for um one's like a a werewolf witch kind of thing and the other one's kind of an environmental uh, horror like a, a creep show but but not like in, in terms of the go green stuff it's just basically a, a flat out like uh killer tomatoes or not well you know killer plants you yeah. know all kinds of stuff like just like fun like grindhouse kind of like oh that did they really put that on film that kind of thing you know but in terms of uh, this stuff um what i like to do is i like to mix it up between like a conspiracy conspiracy kind of thing or someone that is in a horror movie like uh, i i at this point, I got quite a few people I've interviewed now for that are affiliated with the Friday the 13th series and things like that. Um, you know, that's kind of like the other side of the coin. That's the stuff I want to do is, you know, make movies and, you know, make music and things like that. Um, but yeah, I might, someone was telling me I should do like a Kurt Cobain book, but there's like so many already that I don't really know what the angle would be that would make mine any different. And I just, I don't want to put out something that's like, oh, well, this is, you know, we already had this with the other books or whatever. So I'm trying to figure that angle out, but not really pushing that one too much. Just concentrating on, uh, I, I do another show that kind of goes, it goes to Twitter first. It's like a live stream kind of thing. But then I have a friend uh, named Six. He puts it on all of his platforms because uh, he's got a podcast on New Prisoners that I'm on actually every week. So he has a whole bunch of things like Spotify and Odyssey and Rumble. So uh, luckily I have uh, good people in my life you know, nowadays. Um, and it's all digital. So, I mean, I, you know, go figure. You know, I didn't think you could make friends at, after a certain age. But, uh, <laughs> I've heard that before too, but uh, it, you know, because of the horrors of the world, and that like-minded people are are either awake or they're waking up. You know, we have to come together. Um, because yeah, doing this alone, it, it's too dark. You know, it, it it does get very dark. Yeah, I'm big into movies too. Um, are you a fan of trauma trauma movies? I'm trying to get Uncle Lloyd on my show. Okay, well, I'm trying gotta... to get. I almost had Kevin Smith on there. I used to do interviews for him years ago. I, I actually, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the movie Clerks. Oh yeah. I just had uh, Brian O'Halloran who played Dante. I had sure. him on Get, Get Mad uh, a couple weeks ago, about a month yeah. ago. Yeah. But yeah. So when did you get into trauma? You know. So uh, I don't know if you can see it here. So there's me dressed as Donald Trump and oh Lloyd God. Kaufman. And yeah, it's Uncle Lloyd. Yeah. Uncle Lloyd. And I starred as Donald Trump in a trauma movie in the latest one, Shakespeare's Shitstorm. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and uh, I do um, I do some I do some acting and comedy and, and like the thing I'm known for the most is my Donald Trump impression. Um, so I'll play I'll play this little clip here of me and Lloyd in front of the White House. Let me just say what a thrill it is to have an American hero in the White House today, Mr. Prosperio, Prospect Park, Rossboro. You're a great guy. So great. Wow. Honestly, so hot. So <laughs> Let me just say what a. <laughs> How? <laughs> what is it like to work with that uh, Lloyd Coffin? Seriously. He's awesome, man. He's he's a, he's a sweetheart. And he's he's mellowed out with old age. I mean, he's almost eighty now. Yeah. Um, but um, he started with Oliver Stone, I believe, right? Like, yeah. Right? Him and yeah. Oliver Stone were buddies. They went to Yale together. And uh, yeah. I had I actually I had I had uh, Lloyd on Jackman Radio last year or the year before, and he's like, "Oh, we Lloyd's like we went our own ways." And uh, I'm still doing my movies. I mean, he's doing his movies, but now Oliver Stone is busy going to Russia, kissing the ass of Putin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's way long. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although I, I do, I, I enjoy Oliver Stone's uh, dictator movies for sure. Oh but, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, so and, the, and and Lloyd, I, he was in Rocky. People yes. don't remember that. The very was, first scene. Or, was, uh, or after um, the, the fight. Yeah, he, he was in it, and he uh, I think he was a production assistant or script supervisor or something. Yeah, I wanted to interview him and just talk about the Oliver Stone and uh, and Rocky connections. You know, I figured that yeah. would have been something that he, he didn't get to talk to, about too much over the years, but... Yeah, so Lloyd, oh. the way I know Lloyd, um, my one of my best friends from college, uh, he works in uh, the film oh. industry, and he started at Troma right out of college as wow. like entry level Lloyd's assistant. He moved. We went to school here um, in New Hampshire, and after we graduated college in '09, he moved right to New York City and wow. got the job with Troma as Lloyd's assistant. So he started ground floor. Well, he's in and, good company, though. I mean, like you got Trey oh, Parker, and Matt Stone. Well, not maybe not the both of them. I think uh, Trey Parker at least, right? With Cannibal, the, the musical. Cannibal the musical. Yep, Troma, yeah. Troma. Um, pretty well produced that or put it out. You know, the Guardians they, of the Galaxy. What's James Gunn? That's right. Yeah, Troma. Yep, James Gunn. Yeah, Tro no Lloyd. Man, a lot of people who are now big came up through Lloyd, and he kind of gave them their start. Yeah, and awesome. um, so yeah, my friend. Um, started you know entry level with trauma worked his way up and now uh he's producing movies in serbia and he works for uh he does stuff with shutter oh uh, yeah shutter. i've been trying to get uh people from them on my podcast just to talk about the distribution and things yeah so awesome, he's man. yep he's he's pretty big in the horror film world and um I knew they were filming this movie in New York and I always wanted to be in a trauma movie my yeah. my twin brother had a cameo in Newcomb High um, the, the last one they did, he played a reporter in that one, and then what was the whole title, Eric, of uh, the last Newcomb High? Because it was ridiculous, wasn't it? Uh, um, return to Newcomb High, like volume two, aka the return, to, return yeah, to, return, return to Newcomb High, yeah. No, but it was like a whole like paragraph, was like the whole yeah. title. I loved it, yeah. And my brother was in, I don't know if he was in part one or two, um. <laughs> But um, so he got to do that. And my Trump impression kind of took off for me and blew up for me in like 2015, 2016, oh, um, yeah. because uh, Trump himself saw me at one of his rallies. And, you know, I, I went to troll at Trump's rallies. I just went. Um, so you, you met know, the man? I don't know. So oh, yeah. You... I've met, I met oh, Trump wow. a few times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to try and get the clip for you. My brother was in Return to Newcomb High Part 2 with Lemmy. Lemmy. Lemmy was in it too. I got um, to I got to meet him at the Rainbow Room in uh, California. Rest oh, time. really? Yeah, that's awesome. What um, exactly? If you don't want me asking, does he have like five boobs, like he's wearing right here? Yeah, there's um, because <laughs> I've met people like that before, but I think it's, it reminds me of um, uh, the the Arnold movie there. Um, oh, Total Recall. Total Recall. Yeah, <laughs> the woman with the three boobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lloyd had some funny prosthetics on. He had like an arm coming out here, and then it's. We can't see it here, but he had some uh, other graphic stuff down here. You know, oh. just the king of uh, Which gross, thank you. gross out yeah. and schlock. Um, <laughs> I love but, that guy. Uh, yeah. So let me get this other video. But so anyways, my, my buddy, long story short, he produced Sh Shakespeare Shitstorm. And, <laughs> you know, I said, dude, is there any kind of opening where it could be a cameo from Trump? Because the movie's political. It's, it's a um, play on Shakespeare's Tempest. 
Yeah. And uh, have you seen Shitstorm? I have. I actually, the last few years have been kind of rough, so I, I'm going to seek it out now for sure. The last, the last few years have been a shitstorm for sure. Um, right, so right. I, I, I filmed this cameo in like, I think September of 2018, okay. and the movie had its big premiere in New York last April. So I got to go to the premiere at the Museum of Moving Image in uh, Queens in New York. Oh, really? And I got to see this movie on a you know giant movie theater screen with 200 people at a premiere, which was a really cool experience. That was really, oh, really man. like a surreal thing to be there and watch that. And I'm like, oh, my God, there I am on a giant movie screen as Trump. Well, you know what? You should cherish that. I'm not saying I, you don't. I, I but do. you know why? Because we, there might come a day, and I thought during the lockdowns and everything, that we weren't going to have movie theaters at all anymore. Yeah. You know? So that's a big thing. Big screen and everything. That's something I, I, I've always wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do, man. It was definitely That's awesome. <laughs> definitely, definitely a surreal experience. Um, do you still act? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 open to act, and I, I haven't. Uh, yeah, I got a few last... uh, scripts I'd like to uh, get done before I expire. <laughs> I hear you. So the thing, the big thing that I'm known for, uh, or that like I've got a lot of press for and done like insane stuff with, was is my Trump impression. So I'll show you. The, vid the video here and uh yeah we can full screen that this, so th this is at a rally uh the night before the new hampshire primary in february of 2016. Okay. You... the media won't show you how many people are actually at my rallies the media are dirty rotten liars i'm challenging jimmy fallon to a trump duel on the tonight show i'm gonna beat him his his trump is a disaster and i can do very well i love my fans and we can't win without you. We need you. Tomorrow's going to be a huge victory. Oh, no. Look at this guy back there. Look at this guy. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is, uh, do I look like that? Please tell me I don't. <laughs> you know, we've got all these Trump impersonators. Please don't. Uh, get up here. Let me see. Believe me, I've never seen this guy. Tell me this isn't Trump. Look at this guy. <laughs> Melania, would you have married this guy? I don't know. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> that's that's great. Congratulations, man. I hope you're making a lot of money. Okay, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, that was Sing the Melania comment. <laughs> oh, Melania, would you marry this guy? I don't know. Oh, oh look, look at, look at this. Basically saying, look at that fat fuck. You know. <laughs> oh uh, man, you, uh, you, you, you looks like you took it well. <laughs> oh, that that was a surreal moment, man. There was like five thousand people there, oh, my and God. Um, so yeah. I was like going to his events just to have fun, just to get a rise, a response from people. Yeah, um, it wasn't about being pro or anti-Trump. It was basically just performance art. It's just stunt comedy. Yeah, and art, and and I just you know, I the, my brother and I have done impressions our whole lives, and Trump was one we had done for a while, and then when he actually was seriously running for president, my friends were like, "Dude, you need to get a whole Trump character because yeah. your impression, your impression." pretty good so if you get like a wig and like an ill-fitting suit and paint your face <laughs> i think, think, it, think it would yeah. be hilarious now so, would, you, would you be willing to take the beard off if uh he really is gonna run like he, apparently what people think you know oh yeah no he's he's running again and yeah. uh I, oh, i'm totally for hire man i have a uh <laughs> i have a professional website um i offer my services so I, so after that moment so a t-shirt company paid me to be there uh, to advertise their t-shirt in wow. character just to get noticed and get it on the press and yeah. hand out samples of the shirt. So I didn't expect Trump would actually see me or like point me out. <laughs> yeah. So that happened. And he was like, Hey man, congratulations. I hope you make a lot of money doing this. And so when he said that, like a bell went off in my head, I'm like, I'm already being paid to be here now. And then the right. actual Trump said, Hey, congratulations. I hope you make money doing this. So and I'm like, captured I captured it on video too. <laughs> yep. I went all in on becoming a professional Donald Trump impersonator and I've been doing it seven, six, seven years. Wow. And it's opened a lot of doors and I've had some crazy gigs and experiences because yeah. of the, tr the Trump. 
So it's uh, it's just that that mixture of pop culture and politics and just surrealism all coming together. Yeah, no, I uh, I could feel it for you, like through you during the footage and everything, where I'd be like, oh my god, did he just point at me? And this was kind of a joke, and <laughs> wow, you just asked Melania of you. <laughs> oh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Trump That's... the Trump thing is, is it's a lot of fun. I mean, he's he's running again, and uh, I just I, I can't believe how many people he just lives rent free in so many people's heads. Yes. Yeah. You know. I was never for or against. I, I kind of put once he became a candidate, he was like with like Obama was like Bush. Like I'm not on either side. And I full disclosure, I think they're all the same. That's yeah, just you just it. sat back and enjoyed the show. Yeah, like George Carlin, who I got to meet. Um, oh, you did before he, before, right before? Yeah, no you passed away. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to get Kelly, uh, his daughter, uh, to come on my podcast, too. Uh, it just we haven't been able to make the schedules work. But, oh, yeah. well, so tell me that story. Where, where'd you meet him? What was that like? Well, it was actually in Cohasset uh, at the Music Circus. Um, it's like sure. one of these uh, outdoor, or like, it was like a tent kind of thing. Uh, they have another one, the same company called uh, the uh, Melody Tent in Hyannis, I think. Um, yeah, no, just he was doing a show, and it was 2007. Um, I think it was almost just about a year before that. And, uh, it was just after the show. It was just like, Oh, how you doing? I wish I had like a camera at the time. That's the only thing that kind of sucks about the whole thing. You know, um, yeah, cause, you know, and there's no getting a picture now, you know, just what's in my head. Yeah. So. yeah he had his uh, ashes scattered at Lake Spofford, not far from where I live up here in New Hampshire. Did he really? Yep. Oh, wow. I remember he used to make a joke about how uh, he always wanted to have his corpse just drop from a helicopter into like a field with the family just having a cookout of a picnic and stuff. <laughs> I love him. Like, I love you, George. <laughs> I wanted to get like the George Carlin. I wanted to get a shirt that made the what would George Carlin do with like the question mark and everything. Yeah. So I get yelled at by, uh, you know, religious folks. But hey, oh, he, that was he, his stance, you know. <laughs> Man, he just had a way of saying it and putting it out there. Uh, and I, I would imagine you're probably it's a big glow and you ain't in it. <laughs> you ain't in it. And yeah. also, my, my brother and I always remind each other that some of the last big specials he had, the whole set was a fucking graveyard. Yeah, and it was dark. It's fucking dark. <laughs> you know, the, the special that he was doing, no, really, the special he was doing, right? Like, literally, it was, I think it was a couple of days or maybe a week before 9 11 was called there's uh, i i hope and pray uh, i'm paraphrasing or i'm totally screwing it up it was something like i'm praying for all the burning bodies to come out of the sky and stuff and then 911 happens <laughs> yeah, yeah. That now it's it pretty eerie I, uh, no, no yeah i think he, yeah he had a bit maybe it might have been about either attacks or natural disasters where he there's just something about the bodies falling he out he wants of the sky. maximum amount of death and carnage to occur yeah Hey, you know, hey, I got a dark sense of humor, so well, I can look hey, back and laugh look, about it now. But at, in those days, yeah, you didn't want to talk about that. You know, when when tsunamis and like Katrina happens, you know, sometimes Mother Nature. Oh, no, yeah, tsunamis, uh, Gilbert Mother, Godfrey. Mother, Mother Nature gets a win. They get a couple. You know. Yeah, they do. You they know? do. God. Or but, I was. Yeah. My 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 cousins were telling me about a volcano that erupted and like people fell in it and they died and I'm like, dude, score much. five for the volcano. Yeah, you, you don't know? live next to a volcano. Dude, I mean, don't go, I'm, don't go fuck around with an active volcano and think like something bad's not going to happen. If I'm going to go to, you know, go use the facilities or the bathroom or whatever, you know, uh, on the side of the road, and it just happens that there's a volcano right there and I fall in, make as many jokes as you want, please. You know, <laughs> I <Yeah>. would. <laughs> Carlin's great. You know, really one of the only modern day comedians, he's my favorite comedian currently, uh, who even holds a flame to Carlin, in my opinion, is Tim Dillon. Oh, are you kidding me? He is awesome. You like oh, Tim? Yeah. Oh, I love Tim Dillon. Yeah, I've been trying to get oh. my, my friend Don, the author, I'm trying to get him like on his, uh, Tim's show, but Tim doesn't really interview people like too much. He did in the beginning, I think, when it was called Tim Dillon's Going to Hell, I think it was. Yeah, when, he was, at, when he was at Gas Digital. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he so he had on uh, that the CIA guy I talked to you about who I they become buddies with, uh, John Kiriako. He yeah, had him on. We have to go back to that too after because I cut you off about that. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. He had him on, and then he had on another guy who my brother and I had on, Russ Baker, who wrote Family Secrets about the Bush family. The Bush being a Dealey Plaza and all that. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, just the, the there's the, a the picture of yeah. I remember the guy that. looks like him, but even deep beyond that, like the family's business oh, dealings yeah. and that Poppy Bush was lifetime CIA and um. So when when the first time I ever heard of Tim Dillon was I think probably his first appearance on Rogan. Yep. And he had a copy of that book and he had, he showed it to Rogan. You want, looked, you want to get Joe back into conspiracies? And, I yeah. And I looked at my brother. I'm like, Jesus, man, this guy's hilarious. He's funny. He's, uh, you know, he uh, knows some stuff. He knows, <laughs> he knows his shit, and he's got Russ Baker's book on Rogan's podcast. I like. I need to find out more about this guy. And he's so talking was, about the Franklin scandal too. Like, oh, I'm talking saying. about Franklin? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. And you, and clearly, all that stuff informs Tim's comedy and his oh, yeah. outlook. So I, I would think that you know we probably have a very similar outlook at the world and, and the the comedy to deal with with the darkness. But uh, yeah. I've seen Tim live now three or four times, and he's just he's awesome. Yeah, I haven't had the pleasure yet. I mean, uh, you him and like Doug Stanhope is another one, that I, and Bill Hicks. Like, I loved Bill Hicks too. Yep, Stanhope's awesome. Um, I had dark. Oh, so dark. With his mother and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a common thread, you know. These guys, the darkness, and uh, oh. Tim Dillon's mother is schizophrenic, and she lives in a home. He makes fun he, of her. He riffs on it. my mother, who during COVID didn't even realize that her roommate had died, <laughs> and then after she died, and they took the body out, my mom's like, "Put on Tucker." Put on Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rogan's like, "Oh my!" <laughs> oh, he's like, "Holy shit, man!" Yeah, yeah he's not afraid. Oh. No, it's it's, got balls. <laughs> it's it's so good, man. Well, that uh, we're coming up on an hour here, Chris. So, um, if you yeah, want to just tell, you, uh, I kept uh, no, no, you know, was, this is a great conversation, off. man. I definitely yeah. want to have you on again, and uh, yeah, just tell people uh, where they can find you and, and how they can support you. Well, uh, I have a PayPal and a Cash App thing, and uh, I am still trying to figure it out myself. Uh, so that doesn't help. But uh, you can find me at uh. Actually, no, I have a link tree. Uh, a good friend of mine just put together for me. It's on my Twitter page. Um, uh, it's at C Graves Mask Guy, M A S S G U um, I. I used to have it as uh, a different name before I had podcasts. It was C Graves Mass, you know, a swear word. So I figured if I'm going to try to get guests, maybe I shouldn't have a curse like right in my uh, name. So, yeah, C. Graves Mask Guy at Twitter. I was shadow banned uh, for a while. And then David Knight, of all people, actually gave me a couple of shout outs um, and Tony Arterburn and all them. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Get Mad with Chris Graves. Uh, that's on Ocelli.com. And that's going to start Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays coming up uh, February 6th, I think. And I do digging Chris Graves. Uh, on uh, live stream right on my Twitter page. And then the replays are on uh, the new prisoners, the TNP, uh, their platform. So it's all on my link tree. So Cool. Yeah. And, and I, folks, I put Chris's link tree in the description oh, of this you. video. So I got that, that in there too. Thank you. Well, that is awesome. Well, awesome, man. Yeah. Well, keep, keep doing, uh, you know, what you're doing and I, you know, I appreciate your work and, find uh you know, look into you yours too like with that, that, yeah that made me laugh in the trauma like, wow <laughs> yeah i try to like i said I try to have balance with all this stuff you know you don't want to yeah, you don't want to get get uh bogged down with just the conspiracy stuff and the darkness no, not at all. <laughs> you want to you want to you want to balance it out with gay frogs and uh, the gay frogs have the documents taking taking some nice summer trips to bohemian grove with henry kissinger and coconut bras oh wow know? yeah you have yeah. them down too oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, my brother does it even better. I'll next time we have you on, my, my we'll have my, my brother and uh, he's yeah. he's. Do we do like, Alex Jones? Or do like... uh, we we do, we do all kinds of bits. He does Lindsey Graham. We do uh, we do Jesse Ventura. I was a yeah. Navy SEAL, Chris. I was okay. a Navy SEAL. When nine eleven happened, I went into I went into military mode. Okay, yeah. I, I got up my fifty cal and I hunkered down and I frog I frogged <laughs> down from from on top of the governor's mansion with a fifty cal. Can you say I ain't got time to bleed? I ain't got time to bleed. I ain't got time to bleed. I see you. they're all the same. I don't. I ain't avoid. got time to bleed. I, I I had Ventura on the show a couple times. He's a he's really? a really yeah. He's he's a cool guy. I got to interview him in person in uh, New York City. So uh, so on one weekend I interviewed Jesse Ventura, and then the next day I went to David Ike's ten hour in person. <laughs> and they had a fight on his show. Too. They did. Yeah, yeah. She show me the lizard people. Show them to me, David. Oh, you like the cross. Yeah. And, <laughs> And then uh, Ike's like, mate, it don't work that way, mate. It don't, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta read me four hundred page book, mate. Show me the lizard, David. Show him to me. I want to take a chair to the lizard's forehead. 
But, um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 all incredible, man. Well, cool. Well, hang out with me after uh, yeah, yeah. I end this broadcast. But folks, thanks for tuning in. That's Chris Graves. He's a he's an interesting guy, and uh, <laughs> glad we could get him on. And I hope you enjoyed this chat. And please consider becoming a patron of Jackman Radio, patreon.com slash Jackman Radio. Five dollars, ten bucks a month is the best way to support Mike and I keep growing the channel and doing interviews and traveling and buying equipment and hiring film crews. It all costs a lot of money. And, uh, you know, we need the money to do that. And we want to do great work. We will, we'll take Russian money. We'll take gold bullion. We'll take shit coin, light coin, bot coin from Dennis Rodman. Okay. If he's got it. But thanks for tuning in and we will be back again soon. Have a good night and take care.